Good afternoon, everyone. Our Rutland local interagency team has designed and facilitated several trainings this fall to help those of you who are working with children who are in need of support from all of our community partnerships. The teamwork of DCF, mental health, parent, and education is not just for these trainings. It's reflected in our commitment to work together to support our families. Some of you have participated in training focused on the coordination of services in the past, and some of you are new to the field. All of you are committed to helping our children and their families. I hope that today's training provides you with procedural information that will help you navigate the process that not only fulfills our legal obligation, but it also helps us support the children in our community. And I think Jen is gonna lead us off. All right. So just kind of jumping in now, what is a coordinated service plan or CSP? The purpose of a CSP is to just have one plan that represents a holistic view of the child and the child's family. It's considered an addendum to an existing treatment or education plan, plan of support. So behind CSPs, there is legislation and that is Act 264. In some areas of the state, they refer to CSP meetings as Act 264 meetings. So that's kind of interchangeable. So Act 264 is the legislation that addresses the need for service coordination for children that are experiencing severe emotional disturbance. And there's a mandate that comes along with that. So it requires that mental health, education, and child welfare all work together to coordinate. And how is that done? So it's done by developing individual plans for children or youth in need. And it gives us an opportunity to do some interagency planning, which could include things like budgeting and service development. I would just like to give a little historical perspective that this act was passed in 1988, and it was passed specifically for families to be able to access higher levels of care for their children with social emotional disturbances without having to put them in custody. Um, so that they could access like a, an evaluation or a residential placement, a therapeutic residential placement. That being said, in 2005, there was an agreement that extended that to all children who fit any special education plan. And I, I just think that, you know, you need to know that once again, this is only a Vermont law. So in my travels and people ask me what I do and I explain and they our other states, people go, oh my God, I wish we had that for our kids and our families. So we're lucky. I know sometimes it doesn't feel like we are, but we are, yay. Entitlement, who is entitled to a CSP? What does that mean? What does that look like? So children and adolescents are entitled to a CSP who meet the definition of special ed in Act 264 and or they are eligible for special education and are eligible to receive a disability related service covered by at least one AHS department. When we speak of entitlement and CSPs here locally, we really do take a liberal approach. And I think Krista can speak to that. We really don't deny a CSP for a child. Krista, I'll kind of let you explain that in a little more detail. Yeah, so I have never told a family or a team that a child was not eligible for a CSP. I often don't even ask if they meet the definition for an SED or if they're on an IEP. I just say, is there a problem that we need coordination for? And the, if the answer is yes, then go ahead and let's meet. Because oftentimes, even if if we're not talking about the longer term plan of a CSP, the format for this meeting can be really helpful and useful to a child, no matter what, what the situation is. Thanks, Krista. I've always felt that any child could meet one of these criteria if you really pushed. Right. So I've never denied it either because I've looked at these and said, well, if one and two don't account, I can get, I can get to the law mandates. That's what I, so I've never denied it either, Krista, but I loved hearing why you don't deny it. And then I don't, because I think you can kind of rationalize any child that needs it as one of these categories. Accessing a CSP 
With the parent or the guardian's permission, anyone can request a CSP and parents can request it at any time. So in, in Act 264, the legal entitlement is for the coordination of services under the CSP plan. Um, entitlements to specific services are not part of that. That's determined by other laws and mandates. So the requirement is that we are working together or coordinating the services, not um, actually saying you're eligible for this specific service or not. Just because we talk about services within the CSP that might be available in the community doesn't mean that the family is entitled to them. It doesn't mean that because we discuss them in a CSP that they're going to get bumped to the top of the list to receive those services. It's going to be based on whether that agency or school or whatever um, feel that that's an appropriate service and then have that service to provide to the family. This is really where our empathy and understanding of what each of our agencies or bureaucracies can and cannot do. And so rather than get into, you know, in coming into a meeting and thinking and having intent of one of our agencies, we all understand that it's up to those individual agencies to go back and look at funding and what's appropriate. And it's not our job at the meeting to call each other out or think that one of us is responsible. So this is really about the professionalism at the meeting and how we present with that family, because we certainly want to present as a united front, not as a divided group. So in terms of you know, what is needed in order to be able to develop a coordinated services plan, first of all, the child is eligible for a CSP. Um, and, and so far as I know, you know, there's not really like an eligibility process like we might use like in special ed or for accessing other types of services. So um, sometimes people get hung up on that word eligible, but like Krista's already said, um, you know, if, if there's a team that is willing to come together and, and coordinate um, services for a child, um, then we, we kind of all jump on deck to do that. So there needs to obviously be an identified need for coordination. And so by that, we're usually looking at um, in children or students, adolescents that are, you know, working with, with at least two different agencies. Um, so for example, you know, the child may have an IEP through their school and they might receive some services from Rutland Mental Health. Um, they may also be a family that is um, and coordinating with, with our partners at DCF. Um, maybe it's a child that is um, receiving medical treatment, like through our pediatric offices or something like that. So there can really be um, a variety of different um, agencies or needs that are involved. And um, as some of you know, I say it's a bit like writing a grocery list. You have to remember all the things you have to buy at the store. Well, the same is true when you're trying to, if you're that family and you're trying to like coordinate everything that you have to keep track of, um, it can get overwhelming and just plain difficult. So having representatives of the different agencies come together and sort of assist in making that coordination more smooth and more effective is really the name of the game. Now the parent or guardian or caregiver does need to sign um, what we call a release of, of information, which is basically a, a permission form of sorts that allows the coordinated services plan team to meet and discuss and share information. Um, so it it is a process that that doesn't move forward without that consent. There's, there's got to be an informed consent signed. Um, and then there is, there is always a review of factors that have to be considered. So what SIN says is that each child is very much like a snowflake. They're all unique and different. No two are the same. Um, I stole that from her. I use it all the time. Um, so regardless of whatever diagnoses or labels or whatever that that child or family is bringing to the table, they are still very much different and their factors have to be considered 
um, on a case by case basis. So one family is not like another one child or student is also not like the other. Um, so those individual factors um, have to be understood and, and discussed as part of the process. Um, and I think we're going to talk more about that later. Um, but when I say like factors to consider, you know, some things that that we encounter, does this child have a disability of any sort? Does this child have a medical issue or medical need? Um, who are the providers or the people the child may have worked with, you know, in the past? There's just a lot of things that that come together as factors for consideration. Um, and then lastly, um, which we'll be talking about, obviously, um, the most recent version of the coordinated services plan form is from 2019. And we're going to, you know, walk through that a little bit, but there is a, uh, an agreed upon form that is in place um, that is completed by CSP teams um, as they're meeting. So um, those are really the, I guess, the five key elements, if you will, of things that need to be kind of in place. In terms of who is on the CSP team, um, the following are the people that, that generally must be represented at, at the meeting. So first of all is the child or youth or student. Um, but you know, it, it may not always be developmentally appropriate to have a four or five year old there at the table, but maybe it is much more appropriate to have an adolescent at the table. So teens do need to think about whether that's, that child should be there or not. Uh, but even if the child is not physically at the table, um, their voice and their needs should absolutely be represented by the people who, who are there. So um, the family or guardian or caregiver um, certainly is, is someone that needs to be at the table as well as um, any natural supports. And again, we'll talk about that later, but that could be like a really close friend of the family. It could be a, you know, a parent support person or advocate, like someone in SIN's role. It could be anyone that is connected to that family um, that is able to offer them a level of support. Thirdly is what we call the designated agency. So in Rutland County, that would be Rutland Mental Health including its Division of Developmental Services, which serves kids with cognitively based intellectual disabilities. But the designated agency should be at the table, particularly because you are generally talking about emotional types of needs that, that the child has. Um, and Krista will talk a little bit about what happens when the child has not been previously involved with um, a designated agency. Um, so she'll expand on that, but at least you want to know that you do need to have a, a rep from mental health at, at your table. If they are open to the mental health or developmental services side, the person or people who are working with the family would um, uh, participate in the meeting. If they are not open to the mental health, then you would contact me to invite me to the meeting. Um, and if I'm not available, I might assign another Rutland Mental Health staff person to join the meeting. Or if it's a child that maybe has something that would be more on the developmental services side of the agency, I might refer you to somebody on that side of the agency to be the representative for the unopened client. And sometimes we might have a representative from both sides of the agency at the table, depending on what the needs are so that we can figure out who, who can best serve that child and family. And just because we are at the table does not mean that a family needs to enroll with our services um, as a result of having us at the table. Thank you, Krista, for jumping in there. Um, so number, yes, number four on the list is someone from the local education agency. So, you know, that might be um, a classroom teacher. It could be someone like myself who's a director of student services. Um, you know, it could be a special educator. It, it could essentially be lots of people, but ultimately it's a person coming to the table who is knowledgeable about 
um, the child's educational and functional um, performance in the school setting. The local education agency, which is actually the school of residence. And so this is important. And Krista and I were just talking about this before the meeting. The LEA is not an independent school provider. So in our area, we have Sheldon Academy, we have Lehigh, we have Long Trail, we have Burn Burton, we have high schools that, that special ed students attend to through school choice. None of those schools serve as the LEA if the child does not live in their town. It is the town that serves as the LEA. So if you have a child that is on your caseload that goes to Sheldon Academy, it's the LEA where they live. It's not the principal that can make any legal decisions for that child, nor should they house records, nor should they be the lead for anything. They are a service provider to the LEA. And that's very confusing and it's a bone of contention and we're trying to clarify that to people. So you could literally be at a meeting and not have an LEA there and you wouldn't even realize that unless you understood that the independent school is not the LEA and you have to go back to the supervisory union and find out who that person is. So the Department of Child and Families, if the child's in custody or there are safety issues that DCF could be helpful with and the family agrees. And this is very important because we do have some older education staff that I do have to remind them that the family agrees. Because at LIT, we always talk about how we are not a strong arm against families. There was a time when LIT played that role like 25 years ago and people would say to families, well, we're gonna have DCF act. Yeah, yeah, we all know that's not DCF role's role. And we certainly don't want that relationship with a family nor to put that out. So some of us in education are sensitive to our older staff who remember that. And we try very hard to break that cycle. And we appreciate anyone helping us break that cycle um, because we certainly don't want DCF to be viewed like an enemy or a, a punisher, someone that's gonna come in and people get afraid. Families get afraid of that. And we want DCF to be a helpful resource, not someone that families are scared of. Also, sometimes, you know, it, families will struggle with different safety issues in the home relative to um, their child. And there are resources and things that, that DCF has that they can offer to really help with some of those issues. So, you know, I know sometimes um, in very many cases, they're also coming just to offer a lens of support for, for families and children that might be struggling with safety issues and you know, maybe truancy, you know, it could be a lot of different things. Um, so the child may or may not always be in custody, um, just, just to, to advise. Um, it's great to ask the family, especially if the child is not in DCF custody, you know, would you like a representative from, from DCF to be at this meeting? Um, and sometimes, you know, I'll let them know, like, these are things that DCF has done before to support children and families. These are the types of resources they have. Um, so even though your child's not in their custody, they can still come to the table if you would like. Um, so that might be a case where the family would either consent or say, eh, no thanks you know, um, seen that happen. Um, and I would have to defer to Jen on this, but I guess there's a, a local process in place as it says here on the slides. I'm going to jump in here for a second. And for those of you in the training that are not part of family services, we do have a request form to have a DCF representative at a CSP. It's just a few questions to kind of help us determine who would be the best person to send to the meeting if we do have the availability to do that. We don't always have the availability. We get a lot of requests, but we really do try to honor them if at all possible. And whenever possible, if there is um, someone from our office who has a connection to the family, who developed a good working relationship with them at some point, or is actively involved with them at that time, we try to send that person if at all possible. Sometimes, um... You know, there are children who are um, going through an adoption process, about to be adopted, or adoption looks like a step that might happen down the road. Um, you know, there are different, different scenarios there. So um, sometimes the CSP team may 
even include representation from like a post-permanency worker from say like Easter seals, someone that's doing um, pre post adoption work with the family you know, there's different, different scenarios that happen there. So they too um, are, are a, a voice of representation at the table in many cases. Um, um, that would also apply to a kid who would be in a kinship placement yeah, to Coral. They can be supported absolutely. by yep. uh, post-permanency. Absolutely. Um, am I turning the parent rep slide over to Sin or am I, do I keep going? <laughs> Sin, you're the expert. We'll let you take it. <laughs> So I um, have been the parent rep in Rutland County on the lit for over 15 years. I absolutely have lived through CSP and lit experience. I, I have a child that I adopted that I took through that whole process to access higher level of care. Um, and by using the CSP, I actually spared her ever having to go to the Brattleboro retreat. So when we have system meetings at LIT, I am the parent voice. So I try to bring that perspective of what families might want to have heard to the rest of the folks. Um, I am known for saying that, you know, if your feet haven't been on the path, you really don't understand. And I know that my feet haven't been on every path, but my feet have been on a lot of paths. Um, I can meet with families beforehand. I can be at the meeting. I can meet with them afterwards to try to do that processing piece with them. Um, if in fact the family's um, child would be asking for a high, higher level of care, either at um, the case review committee or CRC, as we will hear about later, or the SIT, the state interagency team, um, I can either hook the family up with the parent rep to the case review committee, or I can speak with the folks that's also the same person at the SIT so that they can bring that family perspective with them to the meeting. I, I just, I think that it's really important that folks who don't, haven't walked those paths hear that family's perspective about what it is that they're either experiencing or what it is that they want for that child that they love and adore and sometimes can't stand, but you know, there you go. There is, there is um, a brochure with SIN's information on it in the documents that Krista emailed. And I'll just say that um, I know for myself, I feel very relieved when a family tells me that they are either They've either talked with Sin or they're bringing Sin to a meeting because she has such a, a worldly knowledge of our community and its resources, as well as the education system. So she can help parents to understand um, in a way that uh, they can trust. You know, sometimes they're, they're not trusting of our relationship. And um, because Sin has been, been there, that comes with a, a certain level of trust that they have innately. And so... I'm always relieved when they say they have they have Sina that they've been working with. So the next slide is about who's responsible for leading collaboration. And um, this has been kind of, I would say in my 20 or so years, this has been something that's been, um, there's, there's been some confusion about it. And, and that's because folks felt like if, if they were representing a lead agency, they are the lead agent, that they were then making financial commitments on behalf of whatever entity they're representing. And so to be really clear, the person that is the lead agent is not the person that's taking responsibility for any service that is brainstormed as part of the CSP or lit um, process. Um, the lead agent is the entity who knows the child best and um, who's likely to remain connected with the family. Um, the facilitator of the meeting in, in um, let's see, can work in, in tandem because they're the person who can help guide uh, folks through the, the CSP uh, paperwork. So there can be facilitator and a lead agent. The lead agent sometimes serves as a facilitator. I know that there have been times where um, perhaps there's a new person on the team and they would typically be the one facilitating the process, but they're not feeling confident or comfortable. It's okay to say to your community partner, hey, can you help me out? You know, I don't, I don't feel particularly comfortable doing this yet. Um, but neither role, whether you're facilitating the meeting 
or your agency has taken the lead on the coordinated service plan process, you're not making a financial commitment on behalf of your agency. So uh, coordinating services uh, and planning across the continuum of care. Um, as we said, whenever there's more than one service, we wanna provide coordination. Naturally, that early coordination helps uh, the success of our families. Um, and hopefully it prevents the needs of more intensive services. Um, we also have to coordinate services and start with a, a CSP because to, uh, in order for a higher level of care to even be explored. So you're starting at CSP, you're starting at the, the lowest level possible. And then if with, with all of those supports that have been brainstormed and implemented, if that's still not successful, then you would go to the local entry agency team. But the coordinated service plan is very important in making sure that you've considered the services and supports um, uh, available. As Sin mentioned, you know, the CSP should be a proactive approach and it should be something that is worked on and updated over time. It shouldn't be that a team waits till the crisis happens, has a meeting and then decides, oh, we need a higher level of care, we need whatever, and then expect to be able to take it to the next three teams that I'm gonna talk about in a minute. We, we really should be working the process. So you should be having a CSP meeting, figuring out what are all the supports and services in place? What are the goals we're trying to get to? and then figuring out how can we help reach those goals and then actually try and implement them by getting them connected to the services. If after a time period and the team's been meeting regularly, whether it's monthly, quarterly, you know, whatever, a couple, every couple of months, and it, it's still not working and they need to be bumped up to a higher level, there's three different teams that might be considered. So the next stop after a CSP would be the local interagency team. And so that team is basically made up of the supervisors of all of the CSP team members. So Jen Berkey is there, myself, my boss, Doug Norford, uh, the director of developmental services, the director of agency of human services, SIN, and then there's usually a, a representative from the school, usually the director of student support services. And then at that meeting, you could either bring a family, request to bring a family for additional brainstorming of supports and resources, or if the team is really feeling stuck and feels that there either needs to be a higher level of care or possibly maybe the team's not in agreement with things and needing some help sort of problem solving. If once at the um, lit meeting. Uh, the family does come to a lit meeting and they are part of the presentation. And in that meeting, we make the decision based on whatever the discussion is. And so if it is determined that uh, the child may need a higher level of care, then the lit members are not in a position to approve residential, but they are in a position to agree to send the packet up to the state for review to the case review committee, and then they would determine yes or no, they would approve um, a residential placement. If the team is in a place where we're stuck for additional brainstorming ideas or stuck because we don't have the resources or the team's not in agreement with things, then we might send it up to the state interagency team or sit to get the issues sort of resolved and get maybe some additional support and um, brainstorming done through there. The last time I had a family uh, go through SIP, they did like a little brief presentation to the SIP members for like a five or 10 minute thing. And then they, they logged off the meeting and then SIP continued to meet and then came back with the information to the family afterwards. On case review committee, CRC, they do not, the family does not present at that meeting. If, if we want the family's voice to be heard, as Sin mentioned, she could get the family connected with the parent rep who sits on CRC so that um, she can then bring that information to CRC.
you have to have parental or guardian permission. You can't have it without that. And you can't have the meeting if the parent is not there. Um, or if one of those identified mandatory players are not at the table. Um, you can have team meetings, but you can't have CSPs without them present. Um, and I think that that's why we talk about the CSP in terms of like who the lead or the facilitator is, that it should be somebody who has the best relationship with the family, because then you can be working with the family around why it's important, first of all, to have the meeting, but then also talking about how these services and support can be useful and helpful to them. And I, and I will say, you know, in the mental health world, you know, we always say that our services are voluntary. And so we, as much as we can tell them that, you know, this is the service to support a resource that was going to be beneficial or helpful to you, ultimately they can decline any and all of them. Um, and so, you know, I think that that's just where you continue to build relationships with the family and the child and really try and get them to understand where the benefit could be and maybe work with them on some of the skills. You know, and that too, also where having like a parent representative or other people at the table who maybe have gone through similar experiences can sort of help relate to the family and help them understand that, yeah, you know, I didn't want some strange person coming into my house and passing judgment on me and telling me what I needed to do. And Sin is really great about explaining, well, that's not really how those services really work. And this is how it can be helpful to have those people come to the table and help you. Um, and Krista, I think that um, really encouraging the family to identify kind of their people who are your support people, because often it, it's much more comfortable coming. It can be an intimidating process. All of these people who you know, I don't know who you all are. You might hold some power uh, or you're, you're just, you're a, an intimidating professional who's trying to tell me what to do maybe. Um, so having that support person often is key for families. And then trying to maybe bring those people to the table to help be part of that discussion because maybe grandma could help convince mom that yes, this would be helpful. We had something like that for you when you were little and maybe if you embrace it and bring the, you know, allow these people in, they can help you with your child, you know? So I think too, just really trying to find who has that best relationship with that family and who's going to be able to help convince them that support would be helpful. Well, and I think that it can't be emphasized enough throughout this training about how this is a proactive process. And that we've seen when a CSP has worked well, how it can help families and kids navigate without having to go to those higher levels of care. And, uh, you know, I mean, we really don't like it when there's like some crisis, which we all know people pretty much saw coming or there were other little indicators before that that should have kicked a CSP into, into place before to try to alleviate the stressors and the problems. And so the more often you can do this as a proactive process, the more important and the more impact it will have. So if we have a child that is an imminent danger to themselves or to others that would need to be screened by crisis and then maybe go to Brattleboro Retreat or NFI or Jared House, one of the hospital diversion programs, those placements are really hospitalization based. Those do not require a CSP or a CIC packet or any of that. Those just require an in the moment crisis screening and meeting criteria and then that happens. Those stays at those programs typically are seven to 10 days. Although one of the programs I think is only five days at this point, but they're very short term. And then the plan is that, that child has to return back to this community and the, the receiving team needs to be prepared with support to whatever resources to be able to help that family. 
when we talk about residential level of care, we're talking about long term. We're talking about 60 to 90 day assessment beds where they would go and stay at that program for the 60 to 90 days and have a full psychological assessment completed. Um, or maybe we don't need an assessment. Maybe we've got all the answers we need, but this child isn't able to have their meet, needs met in the community. And so they need longer term residential. And that typically um, is 12 to 18 months. But in order to access that longer term care, you would need to work the CSP and the LIP process before you could um, get to that next step. This is supposed to be a family focused meeting. Like this is about what are the family needs and what is their agenda? What do they want to get out of this meeting? Not what is our agenda and what we think is needed. It's what's going to help the family or that child. Um, so just remember when, you, when you're trying to introduce it to a family, you know, offering it in that way. This is where you can come to the table and offer us your voice about what's going on so that we can address your needs the way you need them to. All right. Well, thank you all so much for your time and attention. I hope that there were some good takeaways. And if there's something that you think of after the presentation, feel free to reach out. And um, Krista sent some materials. Hopefully um, that will give you a little more information as well. Thank Thanks you, everyone. again, everybody. Have a great afternoon.